So I hope everyone had a good chat. And um, our next speaker um, is an entrepreneur in the life sciences um, who I've known for a number of years now and um, who set up a company called Protein Technologies. And um, Fareed has come down uh, from Manchester. It's actually his first day where he can actually speak after having been unwell all week. So we're very privileged that he actually made his way down. And he's slurping up some warm drinks to kind of so that he can keep on speaking. Um, so um, Fareed is a life science entrepreneur and has been working very closely with the University of Liverpool on an enzyme replacement therapy for alcaptonuria, but also on drug repurposing. So what Fareed's going to talk about is the whole idea of drug repurposing, uh, also buying libraries and molecules for drug repurposing, which is something that we've done. Um, he's also been uh, doing some successful drug repurposing in Alzheimer's disease and also on malaria. So um, I will now hand over to Fareed, who will be speaking about collaborative drug repositioning, case studies between universities, SMEs and charities. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, so, this company here, Protein Technologies, is principally what I'm going to be talking about because it houses multi million pound laboratories um, uh, in instrumentation, which um, in a few weeks' time we're going to announce, which uh, will be utilized by any rare disease non for profit organization to utilize uh, the instruments for free, uh, as well as. Uh, any overhead uh, attributed to those as well, projects. And uh, we'll be talking a little bit about, about this afterwards. So today's talk is about collaborative drug repositioning, uh, uh, case studies between universities, SMEs and charities. Um, I think I would like to sort of square the circle because the second speaker um, spoke about folding. Folding is very, very important in the human body and indeed in any life systems uh, because if you don't fold something correctly uh, it will not function and that's something very very important SMEs, universities, charities we unite together to look for cures for diseases so how, how did we start? we started in 2011 I myself was at Cambridge uh, many years ago but before I was at Cambridge and I didn't really become an academic Quite happy about that. I was uh, I was at AstraZeneca uh, at GlaxoSmithKline for many, many years, and I used to screen 100,000 compounds a day. It used to be called ultra high high throughput screening. The paradigm shift had changed because compounds of that nature were combinatorial; they were synthetic. Um, the world has now changed, and we're going back to nature, natural compounds. Very important point. Uh, so. Uh, I've got a number of awards, a couple of million here and there, uh, from industry, some from um, recently over the last four years, about four and a half million pounds from Innovate UK, TSB, and one grant that we've got uh, with uh, the AKU Society of Search and Liverpool Group, with the Wellcome Trust as well. So that was me, uh, sort of uh, a couple of years back, and uh, we then uh, took over laboratories uh, from Novartis and we work with a commercial director called Paul Goddard. But the team is important and anything that you're going to do it's not only the science, but the team and we, what we do is what we say we accelerate drug di uh, discovery. So this is uh, uh, Dr. Tarek Ali uh, there's a couple of other staff here we've got three uh, students here and we've got Santosh and we've got uh, Miss Day as well, there's Santosh over there, and there's uh, Miss Day over there as well, so uh, just an introduction. But we have a world-class team. These guys here, uh, you know, this is the head of Lonza uh, Innovation. So any uh, large pharmaceutical products, these guys scale it up. Um, so another entrepreneur there. This is probably uh, one of the most famous guys in the protein folding uh, arena who used to be partly my supervisor, Professor Alan First, and Dr. Sophie Jackson, who works on protein folding, still in Cambridge, both of them. And some other interesting guys as well, I'll mention them. First thing, it, collaboration. Often collaboration is important in proximity, so when things are together, you can accelerate things. When things are dispersed, when you know, companies are far, far apart, or universities, uh, it's a little bit more hard work. So we're based here in Manchester, and we have a number of companies here, one which is focused on repositioning of Alzheimer's, 
another one which houses many drugs and assays, and another one which makes proteins, as it says on the label. Uh, and so we work here, the MIB, uh, Salford University, Liverpool, who are over here, Manchester and various others as well. And indeed we've had collaborations with the AKU Society. A little bit about Manchester, it's very big. Um, it's one of the largest clinical academic campuses in Europe and there's many students that we can uh, take uh, uh, well advantage of let's say for our screening um, in terms of um, having manpower so what we have here is we have the university uh, we have the hospital we have <coughs> Manchester Science Park which is very important so there's about 160 to about 600 companies here um, so and there's city lab etc so there's a whole ecosystem that's going on in Manchester. So what do we do? Um, we call ourselves uh, the most affordable drug discovery company in the world. Um, we do now uh, drug discovery, we do a lot of protein expression. Uh, we we're going to uh, announce this, uh, we, we want to form uh, a national centre for drug repositioning based in Manchester and adjoining universities, so this is something that we're talking to various universities, so if anybody is interested, we want to form this. Uh, we have no charges for instrumentation, no lab overheads, it's only for staff and consumables related to projects, and this is only for rare diseases in this instance. We we're going to CGMP manufacture, what CGMP means that we can manufacture at scale, so when you have a drug, we can actually do it at FDA standards, and we can actually, you know, then use those in clinical trials or various others. So we'll have that uh, to also uh, in place. We have already made fluorescent probes for preclinical pre research, which is important. We've made new therapeutic probes for cancer, which is quite amazing. Uh, we've de we're developing biosimilars. In other words. Um, not only that we were talking about drug repositioning in terms of drugs which you take a solid dose, we are also talking about the injectables, the proteins, they actually can be uh, repositioned as well. And what we want to emphasize is that we want to go into this partnership model, so partnerships are very, very important. So if you guys are interested, we, we're very happy to partner with you. And I've said that already over the last four years, we've had over four million pounds in services and grants already. So, taking a step forward, um, what are proteins? You know, um, well, proteins are um, structures, they're a little, little bit like this, a beaded structure, which then forms a sort of three-dimensional structure, it could be an alpha helix, for example, or a beach sheet structure. Those structures then form other structures, and you have what we call a tertiary structure, and that structure itself may bind or conform to another structure, which is called a quaternary structure. These structures are very important for their function. If you misplace a scaffold or one of these things here, an amino acid, it will have implications in the folding and the function of that protein. Okay, so that's the first important point. Uh, they are the machines of life. Uh, there are, I would say, just 20 amino acids, but actually uh, we're introducing other amino acids into proteins, but that's a different story. Um, so they, you know, they're, they're important in many, many uh, components, muscle, skin, blood, enzymes, etc. Classic example of uh, revolution biotech. So, you know, in insulin in the 1950s uh, to, to the 80s almost, uh, to inject yourself in insulin, you have to you know, stick a pig in a blender and extract the insulin from it, and that was basically how you got it. Now what you do is you pick the human gene, the, uh, and you insert it into yeast, and you bake it, you make a fermentation, and then you purify the, the, the component. And hence this is a manufacturing route. Yeah? So, but it takes a long time to, when you have a drug, um, you have to test it, and it goes from 10,000 compounds all the way, and it can take up to 12 to 15 years to develop a drug so far. So this is a problem for rare diseases, you know, how can we fast track this? How will we fast track this? Well, how we can do that is using old drugs. Why do we use old drugs? 
uh, because we know that they work in a biological system. It doesn't matter what they do. In fact, some of my students, um, we've found that there's about 30,000 old drugs since uh, um, approved since uh, I think it's been since over the last 200 years. And those drugs, if you did some statistical analysis, almost hits almost all the pathways known in the human body. So this is quite interesting. Uh, so because they're known, they're bioactive, they're safe, and some of them uh, are FDA approved in humans, this, uh, this is a very, very important aspect, which allows us, um, if we're going to develop a, a drug, then you can skip certain uh, toxicity trials. So you can, uh, it will hence um, reduce drug development costs and accelerate drug development, uh, and it improves its you know, chance of success as well. So this comes to this uh, book that uh, I was talking about, and if you're interested, read, read, read about that. So I'm going to talk about sort of three case studies here. Um, so it's a following of a logic if we, uh, of how we can use, utilize targets uh, and to find new drugs. So if you take phenylketonuria, what, what happens here is this enzyme here, phenylalanine hydrolase, um, is that either mutated or deleted in some cases. And if that's mutated, what happens is this phenylalanine accumulates in the blood and causes symptoms. And these symptoms basically, you have abnormal brain development and function. <coughs> you have um, less higher brain abilities and ne neurological, neuropsychological uh, dysfunctions um, and behavioral problems, etc. But if that was due to a missense, in other words, if, if it was due to a mutation error which was substituted by a different amino acid, um, can you rescue that protein? So, genetically, is that possible? Well, it is. So, BH4 tetrahydrobioterin uh, was uh, a synthetic version of BH4, which actually binds to that enzyme. When it binds to that enzyme, <coughs> um, basically, patients who took this, almost 90% of them uh, had a positive response. So, they lowered uh, blood phenylalanine levels. And there were some patients where there, were, there was no response. But those mutations connected to the BH4 response um, were pre pre predominantly um, in the catalytic domain of the protein. Uh, so this is where the mutations occurred and were not directly involved in the cofactor bi binding. I'll explain what this means in a, in a, mid, a minute. Uh, but basically, PKU, there's about 60% mutations or missense mutations, i.e. this is where point mutation of a sing single nucleotide change results in a codon that codes for a different amino acid. So this is the structure of protein, uh, of that particular protein. And these are all the ascribed um, mutations, if you like. And so if you go to the protein and look at it more, in, in, in finite structure, um, you can see that this is the molecule, this is that BH4, it binds away from the, um, the, the catalytic center per se, and it, it orders the, the, the protein. So if you've got a mutation in there, this sort of tightens it up. Not only that, this is a subunit, and then that subunit turns into those four subunits there. So what happens is that the protein, which is mutant, is inactive, and you add your, your molecular chaperone, if you like, and then it becomes active. So you rescue, you tighten up, it changes into an active fold. Yeah? So that's, that's a very important mechanism, and this is what our second speaker was talking about. You know, uh, these are molecular pharmaco chaperones, quite a big word there to, 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 to take in. Into control. So, how do they work? Well, enzyme binding assays. This is uh, this is uh, the same for PKU. Another group here took took uh, six compounds 
they screened a number of compounds and they found six compounds restored um, a particular variant for PKU. They used dead cell based assays which increase the stability against uh, uh, proteolytic degradation. And then one, two of those compounds were put into mice, which again reduced the, uh, the blood phenol anion concentrations in mice as well. So if you look at the logic now, if you've got a, a mutation in this <coughs> disease, and you add these compounds, it wakens it up, makes it structural active. So, uh, and there's other many, many compounds. So there's a huge screen. Although we had that compound, we've got many more here that does the same, if not better than the original compound. So the next question is, you know, shouldn't we be looking for all these mutants or where, wherever these mutations are in rare diseases? Why don't we screen them for these molecular pharmacological chaperones? It's it's as simple as that. So that's what we did. Case study two. So this is a sister sort of disease of Captinuria, and you know Nick, who inspired us, by the way. Uh, I actually met Nick's brother in Malaysia many years ago, and we had a conversation about this, and I met Nick later on, and there was a government sort of uh, link there with the Malaysian government. From there, we got to know more about this disease. And basically here, you have a, a block here. You have a block where you have homogenetic acid dioxidase, which is an enzyme, a bit like PKU, and that block causes a huge amount of HGA, which then produces all of these uh, problems, black urine, uh, de uh, deposits of pigment in, in tissues, etc. Um, so, Nick and I, we started uh, a collaboration with the AKU Society, which is quite phenomenal actually, and within six months, uh, we could produce the enzyme of interest, the corrective enzyme, and that was very important because if we can create the, the, the wild type corrective enzyme, we, could, we were thinking about using it as an enzyme therapy. But actually, what you could do is make mutants of that and then screen it against you know, your drug library, which is all drugs, and to see if you could actually recover that molecule. So we took this route, and it was funded by Wellcome Trust, by, by the way. We also took another route by a, uh, getting a University of Manchester student, master's student, to do the screening of drugs. The AKU Society paid for one of the libraries as well in this case. So, so we screened them against the enzymes, and actually what we did, if you look at uh, the, 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 the HGO in this case, the protein which is responsible for, for this uh, disease, we can make it in E. coli, so you can produce a lot of it. Uh, we know it associates as a hexamer. It has these iron atoms. <clears throat> and basically what we did is, from the crystal structures of these things, we then screened a number of um, the wild type in this case, and we found that by screening the wild type, that we can actually activate even the wild type protein. So next we shift to try to make mutants. And we're looking and we've just purifying a number of mutants that we uh, want to test against a number of our drug drug libraries. So this is what we did first. We can make and produce the protein in quite large amounts. We can also add other entities to this protein as well. So this is remember this is the corrective um, a wild type protein here, we can add large molecules and in fact both of these molecules um, we can express <coughs> and make them uh, in the laboratory. You can see one of them has got a green glow so every time we get a protein we like then just you know, to see whether they glow. There's a whole reason for that. <laughs> what part of that is to follow them inside <coughs> organisms and the other thing is that we can produce huge amounts of this protein. So a bit like insulin, we were thinking we can use this as a you know uh, enzyme therapy, but actually, as it turned out, the enzyme can be mutated and produced, and then we can use them as screens. Not only can we look at the protein, we know it's folded as well by using CD. We know that it's got structure, so that sort of tight structure, if you like, um, and we had assays as well, so we could check the functional aspects of that. Uh, enzyme as well. 
So we screened many, many of these compounds, um, and we knew we can measure the rates. So this means that it's very active, these, these graphs here. And then we went to our compounds. We started putting them, all these uh, enzymes, and added the compounds to it. And lo and behold, you know, we had group A, B, and C. And what we found that group C marginally uh, increased the rates of reactions. Group B did it a lot more, and group A was about 25% increase of the wild type. So now we're going to do the next steps, which is to test compounds and mutant enzymes, measure activity. Just like PKU, the logic is the same. You know, With PKU, we utilized uh, uh, these pharmacol uh, chaperones to, to, to stabilize protein, and we, we're doing this again uh, here. So we want to test the compounds then in cell-based mod models as well. And then, actually, we may even skip mice models, which we can go straight to humans, because what we found is those drugs are generic drugs. Yeah? So they're actually, we're using them in some cases anyway. So we can go straight from there to there. So within, you know, this is another record for us. So in less than a year, uh, we found uh, repositioned drugs. Okay, shifting on a little bit, and uh, the case study three, malaria. Mal mal malaria is not a rare disease per se, but in the Western world it is classified in terms of numbers as a rare disease. But this just shows you again uh, the power of what we can do. Uh, another uh, company called Lumofor Limited houses many, many drug libraries. We work with Salford University. This here is Maria. And this <coughs> is Naroshni, and this is one of my students, which I've just forgotten her name. Uh, anyway, um, but it's it's a big burden, malaria. It kills, you know, many many children, millions. Um, and the problem is drug resistance in parasites. So, what did we do? Uh, yeah, that's the bug which goes in plasmodium into infected cells, and. This is such a massive problem that WHO is saying now that artemisinin, which is um, the mainstay of, of uh, therapy, is now um, being uh, a problem because it's got resistant forms. So we partnered up, and you know a lot of these universities have huge class two, class three um, facilities that are hardly used. So we funded this ourselves in part. And part of the BBSRC also gave us some funds towards this. And we work with a local hospital uh, so we can take some blood and cultivate the malarial um, uh, bug. And so we did all of that. And we found, you know, we had some really good assays, some of them fluorescence based, some of them <coughs> are fax based. So these are cells which are, you know, uh, uninfected. And you know you, these are various types here, and you can get mononuclear and multinuclear sites. And what we found that we screened when we screened all of these, we found that some uh, drugs really uh, did had no effect, but if you combine them, it had a massive effect. So we're talking about formulations here. So that was quite amazing. And some you don't need to have formulations. Some were quite reduced anyway. So these are again, you know, normal compounds that you know nobody knew about, and we knew can work. And we did a dose response curves; and they were amazing. And this was a publication, it was a fairly recent publication, uh, which tells you all about this compound emetine and how it was an anti-protozoal uh, drug anyway for uh, am amoeba, for an amoeba disease. Uh, so this is quite exciting results. Uh, this is now going into formulation and you know trials in, in various parts of the world. So again, uh, less than one year to accelerate this. So these are the acknowledgements. Uh, I don't know if I've gone over or not, but um, yeah, so thanks to all of these guys really. And these and that was Holly by the way. Holly escaped me earlier. And uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>